Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to episode 282 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about announcing dreams. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Akin. Hey, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. Let's suppose you're a prospective mother or father. You have a dream in which be a being of light appears to you and tells you you're going to have a child. The being tells you whether it will be a boy or a girl, tells you what hair color it will have, and even tells you the child's name. Or perhaps you have a vision of your future child, and you learn all those things directly from the child. Or maybe you hear a voice and learn these things. Perhaps you see what's going to happen to the child at birth or in infancy or later in life. All of these are examples of announcing dreams and related phenomena, and they're surprisingly common. What are announcing dreams? What kinds of related phenomena occur and what causes them? That's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. Jimmy, what do we need to say to begin discussing today's mystery? Today, we're discussing mysterious phenomena that occur in connection with children coming into the world, such as before and during pregnancy. But as always on Mysterious World, we're going to be keeping things clinical and seeking to keep things discreet and as family-friendly as possible. As a result, we will not be discussing the mechanics of what husbands and wives do to have a baby. However, we will refer in a very general way to it, since babies are born from as a result of the love of a husband and a wife, we will refer to this as making love, but we're not going to go any further into it than that. So that's what parents need to know about today's episode. We're going to be very discreet. We're only going to say that since children are born out of the love of a husband and wife, the father and the mother somehow make love, but that's it. We won't be going into any more detail than that. So armed with this knowledge, parents can make decisions for their own families about this episode in light of what their children already know and in light of how they might want to answer questions afterwards, even if it's just to say, you'll learn about that when you're older. Thank you as a parent. Thank you. <laughs> so then let's start discussing today's mystery. What are announcing dreams? The Science Cyclopedia, published by the Society for Psychical Research in Great Britain, has an article on them, and in it, James Matlock writes, Announcing dreams are sometimes defined as dreams that herald any sort of life transition, but more often the term is used in reference to dreams that appear to announce the birth of a child. Announcing dreams usually occur to pregnant women, but they may precede conception and they may occur to fathers as well as to other relatives or close acquaintances of the mother. Non-human spirits sometimes deliver the announcements. And a non-human spirit is involved in what may be considered the most famous announcing dream of all, which is this one. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband, Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. That's from chapter 1 of the Gospel of Matthew, and in the Sci Encyclopedia, James Matlock writes, Announcing dreams have been reported throughout history and from many different cultures. That recounted by the Apostle Matthew in the Christian Bible is perhaps the most famous. Joseph and Mary were engaged, but when he discovered that she was pregnant, he began to waver in his marriage commitment. Then he dreamed that an angel told him, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. 
So Jesus himself was the subject of perhaps the most famous announcing dream ever, and in his case, it was a non-human spirit, an angel from heaven, that made the announcement. How common are announcing dreams? They're a lot more common than you might think. Uh, We'll be quoting from a couple of books by researcher Elizabeth Hallett. Her first book is titled Soul Trek, Meeting Our Children on the Way to Birth, and her second is titled Stories of the Unborn Soul, The Mystery and Delight of Pre-Birth Communication. And in writing them, she collected literally hundreds of stories of announcing dreams and related phenomena. Also, announcing dreams occur all over the world. For example, in Soul Trek, Elizabeth Hallett writes, Sheila Kitzinger, in her book Women as Mothers, describes how Jamaican women expect a fertility dream to occur when they have conceived. The dreams are said to involve symbols of abundance, such as shoals of fish or ripe melons. So in Jamaica, women even expect to receive a dream when they've conceived a child. Announcing dreams also occur in some tribal cultures, like the Tlingit of Alaska that believe in reincarnation. And in some cultures, someone may have an announcing dream that a departed soul is going to come back and be born to a new mother. We discussed reincarnation-related announcing dreams back in episodes 275 and again in episodes 276, which were on modern reincarnation research, but announcing dreams also occur in cultures that don't believe in reincarnation, and many of them don't involve reincarnation at all. So today, we'll be discussing announcing dreams that don't involve reincarnation, like Jesus of Nazareth's announcing dream by the angel of God. You mentioned there are related phenomena to announcing dreams. What did you have in mind? These would be similar experiences, it's just that they don't occur in a dream state, like having a vision, which is what the Virgin Mary had when the angel Gabriel announced Jesus' birth to her. That was an announcing vision rather than an an announcing dream, and you can read about it in chapter 1 of the Gospel of Luke. There also can be apparitions, conscious telepathic communications, or even just strong feelings or intuitions. So there's quite a range of experiences here, but today we'll be considering them all under the heading of announcing dreams, even if not all of them actually take place in a dream state. And even though they may not all be birth announcements, we'll call them announcement-related experiences or announcing experiences. We've covered the announcing dream that St. Joseph received of Jesus' birth, but Jesus of Nazareth was a unique individual, so his announcing dream may be different than those of ordinary individuals. Where do you want to start with considering other such dreams? With a book by parapsychologist Louisa Rhine, and yes, it is pronounced Louisa Rhine, not Louisa. Uh, She was the wife of the famed 20th century parapsychologist J.B. Rhine, who started a major parapsychology lab at Duke University in the 20th century. It continues today as the Rhine Research Center, and I take classes at the affiliated Rhine Education Center. We'll talk more about J.B. and Louisa Rhine in future episodes, but back in the early 20th century, J.B. was working at his lab at Duke, and Louisa was bringing up their children at home. However, she also had a PhD and wanted to contribute to the research, so she began to catalog and classify the unusual experiences of people who wrote to the lab. In 1961, for example, she published some of the results in a book called Hidden Channels of the Mind. When I was researching this subject, I wanted to see if any announcing dreams had been appearing in this research, and they had. Hidden Channels of the Mind contains multiple accounts of announcing dreams, so they were recorded fairly early in the history of modern parapsychology, and here's one of them from that book. A couple in Pennsylvania, waiting vainly for years for a child of their own, had finally applied for a baby to an adoption agency. After some more long waiting, a call had come of a prospective baby for them to see. The night before they went, the woman says, I pray that the Heavenly Father would show us in some way whether or not the little boy we would see was the one God really intended us to have. That night in a wonderful dream, I saw a head of golden curls nestled on my husband's shoulder. In the dream, I didn't see the child's face, but I knew he must be around two years of age. I wondered about this because we had hoped to get a much younger child. The next day at the agency, we were just being ushered into a room when we saw a nurse removing a cap from a head of golden curls. Before the nurse turned our little Jimmy around, even, so I could see his big brown eyes and rosy cheeks, I said, oh, 
he's the one. They were all surprised because they had wondered, too, if a little boy of 20 months of age would be acceptable to us, who had wanted a tiny baby. This wonderful dream come true has made my life happy and complete. I'm so thankful. One of the things that's interesting about this announcing dream is that it didn't concern a biological baby of the couple in question. Instead, it occurred with regard to a child they were going to adopt. The woman prayed to God that she'd have a supernatural confirmation of the baby that it was God's will for them to adopt, and she had a dream of the child that they were shown the next day, providing her the sign. Similar announcing dreams of adoptive children are recorded in the literature of the subject, such as in Elizabeth Hallett's books. But most often, the announcing dream involves a biological child, and this is what happens in the next two accounts that Louisa Ryan reports. She discusses them in her chapter on the ESP experiences of men and women. She includes them in this chapter because in the 20th century, there was an idea that women are more intuitive than men, hence the phrase women's intuition. And there had long been an idea that women were more emotional than men. When parapsychology began to be studied, there was an idea that women were more likely to have emotional, intuitive experiences, and so Louisa considered this issue in her book. But she reported that both sexes have ESP experiences, and that they both had ESP experiences of the same types, as illustrated by the following two announcing dreams. ESP is not sex-linked, for many men do have ESP experiences. Do they have the same kinds, and in general, on the same sorts of topics? Certainly, in preceding cases, no particular difference in the topics of men's experiences and those of women is noticeable. Perhaps the farthest out on this line would be the topic of the baby still unborn, which could be considered an exclusively feminine topic, if any is. A woman from Ohio reports, Both my husband and I were extremely happy awaiting the longed-for event. We were in our 30s. I was in perfect health and not at all worried. I thought I preferred a girl, and we jokingly referred to the baby as our little black-haired girl because we both have very dark hair. A few nights before my confinement, I dreamed that some person, not visualized perfectly, came to my bedside holding my baby, drew back its covering, and held it for me to see. I looked long at the face and knew, though no word was spoken, that it was a boy. The face was startlingly unlike my imaginings. Very fair, hair light, the chin noticeably pointed below very fat cheeks. During the delivery at the hospital, an unexpected complication ended in tragedy. When I became conscious, the doctor and nurses were working vainly to try to make the baby breathe. I asked, is that my baby? And a doctor, masked of course, brought the baby to my side, folded back the cover, and I saw the identical and unusually individual face, exactly as in my dream. Afterwards, others commented on the very features I had memorized from the dream. Therefore, the likeness must have been real, not imagined by me in semi-anesthesia. One of the things that's interesting about this announcing dream is that the child was very different than what the parents had supposed. The parents were both dark-haired, and they assumed the child would be a girl. But in the dream, the mother saw that the child was light-haired and that it was a boy. It also had distinctive facial features. Then, when the baby was born, all of this was confirmed and commented upon by others who were present. So it wasn't just the case of the mother's judgment being distorted by anesthesia. Unfortunately, in this case, the doctors and nurses in attendance weren't able to get the baby to start breathing, so the announcing dream only provided a glimpse of the child they would have. It did not indicate a baby that the parents would get to raise, and that also is sometimes reported in the literature. But the point that Ryan goes on to make is that announcing dreams don't just happen to mothers. She states, But the experience of a man from Missouri matches it. He explains, after 17 years of marriage, when our first baby was due in about two months, I dreamed I saw the child with the darkest eyes and the blackest hair surrounded by white that confused me. The child in my dream was a baby girl. At breakfast the next morning, I proceeded to tell my wife of my dream. She and her mother both thought I was wrong, that the child would be a boy and that it would be redheaded. Nothing further was said. The day the child was born, after seeing my wife for just a few moments, the doctor asked if I cared to see our child. I proceeded to the nursery and saw a number of babies, 
and the doctor had the nurse in charge bring ours to a side door. As soon as I saw the nurse with the child, I recalled the dream. The setting was an exact duplicate of my dream some two months prior to that date, and the white which confused me in my dream was the white uniform of the nurse holding the child. So in this case, the husband had the announcing dream. He saw that he and his wife would have a dark-haired baby girl, but his wife and mother-in-law thought that it would be a boy, and presumably based on inheritance patterns within the family, they thought it would have red hair. They also were skeptical based on the white that the father saw around the baby's dark hair, but this seemed to him to be explained by the nurse's white uniform around the baby's hair. So his announcing dream seemed to be fulfilled. Now, in the case of the mother from Ohio, her baby tragically died at birth when they couldn't get it to breathe. But announcing dreams also can help provide reassurance, as Ryan describes here. Of course, many ESP experiences, as the reader may already have noted, do serve a purpose. The person is able to take advantage of ESP information when it comes. It is like the light of a lightning flash to the wanderer in the dark. For instance, a woman from Oklahoma found that her experience helped her surmount a period of great anxiety. She was expecting a baby in January 1952. On the night of October 30th, 1951, she dreamed, she says, I was standing outside a nursery window with my husband, parents, and some friends, and we were looking inside an incubator at a very tiny three-pound premature baby girl. She was ours, and although so very tiny, she was bright-eyed and active and perfectly formed, and we were all of the opinion that such a lively baby would come through all right, in spite of being premature and so tiny. In my dream, the baby had lots of long black hair, very large bright eyes, a tiny red button of a nose, and the tiniest mouth I had ever seen. Her unusually small head had lots of long black hair to her shoulders and perfect finger and toenails on fingers and toes no bigger than match stems. A baby perfectly formed in miniature. She was waving her arms and kicking her feet as any normal active baby does and even turned over. The next morning, I told my husband and my parents and another relative who was visiting us at that time. It was such a vivid dream, and I shall never forget watching that tiny baby and noticing all the small details about her as only a mother would. My family and friends dismissed it as one of the many odd dreams which pregnant women are supposed to have. However, just 16 days later, they were all truly standing at that nursery window looking into an incubator at our tiny two pound, 15 ounce baby girl a baby perfectly formed in miniature and in life the exact duplicate of my dream with only one slight exception. Although she was quite active as in my dream, it was some time before she was strong enough to turn over. Had I not told anyone of my dream before, I'm sure they would have found it difficult to believe after the baby's birth. Also, as in my dream, I heard so many make the remark that such a bright, normal acting and lively baby would come through just fine. And she has. In a short time, she was a fat, roly-poly, normal baby. I'm sure my dream helped me over those first anxious days after her birth. So in this case, the mother had a dream of an active, vigorous, premature baby. The woman went on to have a premature birth. The details of the baby she dreamed about matched those she saw upon birth quite well, and this provided assurance to her that the baby would survive. So these were accounts that Louisa Rhine reported in her 1961 book, which was a general summary of ESP reports of all kinds, and not focused specifically on announcing dreams. Announcing dreams are thus a well-reported phenomenon. And in recent years, there has been a concerted effort to collect them. Leading this effort has been a woman named Elizabeth Hallett, who has published the two books on the topic that we mentioned, and she collected accounts from literally hundreds of people. She also categorized them into chapters based on the type of experiences people reported, and she put the chapters in a kind of rough chronological order so they walk through the experiences that occurred before the baby was conceived, to after the baby was conceived, to the point of birth, and even after the birth. What would an announcing dream or a related phenomenon that occurred before the baby was conceived be like? Can you give an example of that? Hallett gives a particularly striking account in her second book, Stories of the Unborn Soul. She reports the case of a woman named Jill who perceived the presence of her child before conception. She writes, 
A few months ago, my fiance Rob and I were lying in bed and simply relaxing. We began kissing and were both inspired to move on to bigger and better activities. All of a sudden, I had the most beautiful, warm and tingly feeling. I knew I had felt a child, our child, in the room with us. I immediately stopped Rob and said, if we make love right now, we are going to have a baby. I was surprised when he said, I know. Rob and I both felt nothing extraordinary in a physical sense, maybe just a warmth or for me, a ticklish feeling in my uterus. It was more an emotional, spiritual experience for us. The cool thing is that although it was amazing, it wasn't a foreign feeling at all. In fact, we agreed the feeling was familiar and totally unique at the same time. It was literally like a wash of a loving, powerful and familiar presence over us. From what we can determine, we felt very similar things and at the same time. So both Jill and Rob perceived the presence of their child before conception. It was as if the spirit of the child was in the room with them, and they knew that if they made love, they would conceive the child and become parents. What is especially interesting is that they decided not to do so at this moment, but at a later time. Jill writes, At that moment, we chose to wait. Since then, we have talked about that spirit who visited us. We both agree that it was a girl. I've had contact with her since then through images in my mind's eye. We plan to get married and move to Hawaii within the next year and then begin our family. The most recent contact she has made with me was to tell me her name. Rob and I were confident she would make her name known to us and she did. I wasn't really thinking about names and then her name just popped into my head and I knew. I said it out loud. Laurel. It sounded so right. I told Rob that she had given me her name and he asked what it was. I was too afraid to speak it to him. What if he didn't like the name she'd already chosen? Spy spelled it for him and he said it and a huge smile came over his face. He knew it was perfect. Laurel Evelyn Butterworth. Rob and I have discussed the reasons we are blessed with these meetings. We think it is simply because we are open to them and we live in a space of love, at least some of the time. We know that we are the conscious creators of our lives and that a child will be consciously welcomed into our lives in perfect timing. We respect our child's spirit as a powerful being and we respect her choice to be with us. She'll be an equal partner in our decision to have her join us in this realm. So Jill and Rob both perceived that the spirit was that of a girl child. Jill believed that the child's spirit was periodically in contact with her, even though it hadn't been conceived yet. They believed that the child would reveal the name it wanted to have. Eventually it did, and they both felt the name was appropriate. And then eventually the child was born. About two years later, Jill announced, I am happy to say that Laurel Evelyn has indeed joined us and is now almost seven months old. She's exactly as she told us she would be, and just how I saw her in my mind and dreams. So at least as things appeared in this experience, the prospective parents sensed the child who would eventually be born to them. They decided not to have the child immediately, but Jill said she had periodic contact with the child. The child said what name she wanted. Eventually, the parents did conceive her. The child did turn out to be a girl, and they believed it to be the same one that they had had contact with prior to conception. There are other similar situations. In some of the cases that Hallett reports, a woman may receive a vision of more than one of her future children. One of them will be born soon, and the other will be born later. And they both have the characteristics seen in the initial vision of them. These experiences occur before conception. Does anything in particular take place when conception occurs? It can. Uh, Many women in these accounts report knowing it as soon as they've conceived. Some even report the moment of conception, which can be up to a few days after making love, being attended by an unusual phenomenon that is perceived mentally. For example, in Soul Trek, Hallett reports the case of a woman named Lin Shank. Both she and her husband experienced the unusual phenomenon. Lin writes, We had made love and then were lying talking. Suddenly I saw a bolt of multicolored light come down through the ceiling and through the bed under us. As I see odd things often, I didn't say anything. But my husband said, wow, did you see that? He described the same bolt of lightning. I laughed and told him I had seen it too. It later turned out that that day was the conception of our third child. In this case, both Lynn and her husband mentally saw the phenomenon, which appeared to be external to both of them. 
but sometimes only the mother is aware of it, and it may not manifest as something external and visual, but as something internal, as in the case of this woman. I knew precisely when I was going to get pregnant. I remember sitting on the bed, talking with John as we prepared to go to bed to make love. I said, you know this time we'll have our son. Are you ready for that? He shrugged and smiled. Yeah, why not? He said with a twinkle in his eye. We already know he's on his way. Sure enough, he was. For me, the moment of conception was loud and clear as a bell. In fact, with both children, as well as other conceptions which did not come to term, I knew the precise instant of conception. It was like a big pop inside of my consciousness and a shifting of energy accompanied by a subtle kaleidoscope of color. On the other hand, the mother may not realize that she's pregnant, but the father may, as in this account. Diana Lawrence relates that her father had a vision while sitting in church the morning after her younger sister was conceived. An angel came to him and told him he was going to have a daughter. When he told my mother of this, she dismissed it as altogether ridiculous. She had no intention of having another child. They had two boys and two girls already. And furthermore, her period was due any day. Nine months later, my younger sister, Angela, was born. In this case, it was an angel who announced the pregnancy, but sometimes the child itself makes the announcement and may even interrupt what the mother was otherwise listening to, as in this case. A young woman had just asked her college instructor a question when her normal hearing was interrupted. I was very interested in her answer, she says, yet I couldn't hear her voice. Instead, I heard a voice, which was mostly like a buzzing sound, saying, The reason you have felt physically burdened and emotionally burdened is because you have invited me into your life. I am here with you. I am here. I felt very warm then. My heart felt warm, as if I had just been hugged by an old friend. I found out the next day that I was two weeks pregnant. So the voice of the unborn child blotted out the voice of the college instructor that the mother was listening to at the time. Such communication between the mother and the unborn child is also reported to sometimes continue throughout pregnancy, and dreams during pregnancy may also report information about the future. For example, here is an account from a woman named Roxy. End of November 1981. Dream. Body told mind I was pregnant. They argued. Body won. Mind said no, can't be. Body said yes, yes, you are. I awoke feeling nauseated, flu-like. I ignored the dream as flu was going around. Two weeks later, I had blood work done. I was pregnant. This seemed to be the beginning of my dream awareness. First trimester dream. I saw Rayanne as an eight-month-old with rash crying. At eight months old, Rayanne had to go on formula as I had to take radioactive material that would go through my breast milk. She broke out in a rash from the formulas. As soon as possible, I resumed breast milk and the rash disappeared. Rayanne at eight months was exactly like the dream. This dream was apparently precognitive in nature with information coming from the future, but a mother may also feel that information is coming directly from the child, as in the case of a mother named Isabel Kessler. I was sitting in a sun-filled room feeling blissful with the contemplation of this child inside me. I was wondering what names I would choose and whether a boy or a girl. I heard slash felt a voice. It was a knowledge within me say, my name is Abraham. I'm a little male child. It takes nine months to make a body. Then we'll meet. And sometimes the information seems to flow from the mother to the unborn child, as in this account from Mother Christina Bystrom. The midwife checked me at 32 weeks. Arnie was breached, so she gently turned him. Within a week, he had turned back. I felt this occur, first as he turned sideways, then all the way back to breach. That evening, I lay quietly on my bed, my bottom slightly elevated by pillows. I relaxed, breathed, and visualized my baby inside of me. I talked to him silently, first about general things. I love you. How are you doing in there? Warmth, etc. Then I specifically asked him to turn head down while envisioning his movements and concentrating heavily on his head in my pelvis. I explained to him, again silently, that this position would make for an easy birth. And I just kept visualizing. I lay there for 45 minutes or so before getting up. Within two hours, I again felt him turn. His entire body shifted, a huge movement. I believe what made it effective was the fact that I communicated with my son, virtually from the moment of conception, speaking to him both aloud and silently. 
I visualized him within me as well. Also, I remained receptive. It's all very exciting. Apparent communication with the unborn child also can end up saving the life of the child, as in this case from an unnamed mother. When I discovered I was pregnant, unmarried at the point of graduation from college, I was very confused, unsure as to what the pregnancy would mean for me. I had no friends at the time who had children and no models. After I was sure I was indeed pregnant, I made an appointment to have an abortion in one week. During that week, I tried to explore my feelings, tried to project into my future. Should this baby be born to me now or not? Needless to say, the week proceeded intensely, tearfully, frightfully, and soul-searchingly. After talking and talking with friends, it occurred to me that the answer wasn't going to come in talks with friends, but must come from some inner source. So the day before the scheduled abortion, I went into my room, closed the door, and sat down to meditate. My meditation was a deep yearning, asking, opening for some sign, some answer that would guide my actions, abortion or birth. When I closed my eyes, it was a sunny spring afternoon. At some point, I had no concept of the passing of time the way you don't in a crisis. I heard a voice within myself, but at the same time all around me. I want to be with you. At that moment, a feeling of peace fell over me and I began smiling and opened my eyes, just hearing this voice, which was, in an image in my head, the child within, made me feel calm and this confusion melted away. It was dark and nighttime when I got up. The next morning, I canceled the appointment. The child is now eight years old. Something similar happened in the case of a Japanese-American woman named Linda. As much as my fiancé and I were overjoyed to find out my unexpected pregnancy, I was confused and terribly saddened to think I would not be able to go back home nor take up the job offer I had. At this time, my fiancé was also out of a job. Also, the prospect of putting my family to shame by being pregnant before marriage, Japan is still very traditional, made us consider abortion. I must have spent weeks crying, unable to make up my mind. We weighed and analyzed both situations, abortion versus having the baby. I got all the medical information on abortion and even made an appointment at the clinic to terminate my pregnancy. But one night, my son came to me in a dream in the form of a boy four or five years old, begging me to keep him. His exact words were, Mommy, I'll be a good boy. Please keep me. I won't cause you any trouble. Still not convinced, on the appointed morning, I went with my husband to the clinic with my eyes all red from crying. We paid at the reception, and as I stood in front of the receptionist, cold and numb, trying to hold back my tears, The receptionist turned to me and said, take this money back and go see our counselor. You're not fully sure about this, and I don't want you to go through with it. That was the turning point. We never went back. A week later, my husband woke up one morning and told me he had an unusual dream. At this point, I had not told him of my dream. His dream had the same boy, even dressed in an identical outfit, like an aristocratic English boy of Victorian days. And his dream was of this boy saying, my mommy. In due course, the child was born, a calm and happy baby boy, says Linda. We feel as though we've known him forever. There's a tremendous feeling of love, respect, and friendship towards him. I never thought motherhood could be such an intense experience of total love and joy. Apparent communication from the unborn child may also help the mother. A woman named Vivian Birney writes, There was a period about five weeks before my due date where I was feeling really bad about something related to my pregnancy. I think it was because I had my third cold since getting pregnant and just couldn't eat the amounts and types of foods that I should and couldn't control my negative thoughts. And I felt even more guilt because of these. I was apologizing to the unborn baby in a state of deep shame. And all of a sudden, I felt like I was being hugged by a field of light. And an unheard message appeared in my consciousness, which told me, don't worry, I'm fine. And the unborn child apparently helped the mother in a very dramatic way in this account from Mother Celestia Jasper, recounting an event that occurred three years before her child was born. My husband and I were returning from Minnesota to Montana after spending a disastrous Christmas with my family. My mother had died the summer before. We were anxious to get to our cabin in the Swan Valley, so we drove night and day, even though the weather was extremely cold. We stopped in Great Falls for gas and were warned not to cross Rogers Pass because there was wind and extreme cold. Being young, we went along anyway. After crossing the pass, we stopped for a cheeseburger and fries. It was about 9 p.m. As we started up the Swan Highway, we encountered a snow-packed highway. As we came around the corner down the hill toward Salmon Lake, a large amount of snow blew off the bank above us, causing a glare of snow and lights. 
I thought a car was coming toward us, so I swerved, overcorrected, went into a spin, and flipped once and landed on our wheels in the Stillwater River. We were in a Volkswagen bug. Jasper tried to paddle the car with the snow shovel, but we were in a small whirlpool and just went around in circles. He climbed out the window into the river and got the spare tire out of the trunk for me to float on. He swam for shore, and I tried to push off from the car on the tire. Unfortunately, the tire was attached so that I couldn't use it for flotation as it was going down with the car. By this time, I was ready to give up. Death seemed a treat. I thought I would see my mother again. Jasper hollowed at me from shore and then seemed to disappear under the ice. I resigned myself to an easy death. Then I heard, but I haven't even been born yet. This didn't seem relevant at the time, but a hand or a force or whatever seemed to grab me by the collar of my jacket and much as a cat carries a kitten, propelled me to shore. Later, when we had broken into a cabin and were running out of energy, I woke up and seemed to hear the same admonition. I'm not born yet. We were rescued in the morning. In 1971, Frank James was born. The first night I was home with him, he woke in the night to be fed. As I nursed him, I had a vision back into the past of my mother, grandmother, and so on, nursing their children, and I felt connected to this pattern or plan. Then I knew it was Frank James who had spoken the night of the accident. So in this case, it would appear that the child who hadn't even been conceived yet psychokinetically grabbed his drowning mother and propelled her to safety on the shore, which would be quite a dramatic experience. There's also this account, which is of an incident that occurred during the pregnancy of a woman named Isadora Pamer. When I was three months pregnant with my son, there was wild thumping and bumping in the walls at night. It sounded like pictures were falling off the walls, but nothing had fallen. The first time it happened, my husband sat up in bed and said, what's that? And I said, it's just the baby, go back to sleep. Normally hearing a noise like that would have caused him to search the house for burglars, but he believed me. After a few nights of this, we were getting fed up, so he talked to it through meditation and told it to stop. It did. My son is three years old now, and I recently asked him about this. He has a wonderful memory and remembers his experiences in the womb. I swam around and drank water. It was red in there. He said that he banged on the walls of the house because he was bored. He was a very active, colicky baby. And I think this was just another way for him to exercise his overactive nervous system. What Mrs. Paymer describes is classic poltergeist phenomena, and she somehow perceived that the unborn baby was the cause. We discussed poltergeists before in episode 195, and again in episode 260 on the 21st century poltergeist. Parapsychologists believe that most poltergeist cases are not caused by departed spirits. Instead, they're caused by living human beings who frequently are subconsciously working out stresses through what is known as recurrent spontaneous psychokinesis, or RSPK. Such cases often, though not always, involve children, like the 21st century poltergeist case did. And there's no reason why the child in a poltergeist case couldn't be an unborn child. So if you've got an active, colicky baby who's still unborn, it might work out its frustrations through RSPK. In fact, there might be quite a number of cases like this that have simply gone unrecognized. And it would be interesting to note how many other parents experiencing strange bumping, banging sounds, and object movements during pregnancy there are. Sometimes an announcing dream may occur very late in pregnancy. For example, a mother named Anne Balfrey told Hallett that she had become rather obsessed with the idea of having a baby girl for her first pregnancy. But then this happened. I really don't usually remember my dreams, but this one I'll never forget. In the dream, a luminous being appeared. He, I remember it seemed male, told me that the baby would be a boy. I argued with him and told him I wanted a girl. After a short discussion in which I pouted and stamped my foot, the being shook his head and said, I do believe you would argue with God himself. He began to fade and I shouted out, at least tell me why it has to be a boy. Just a voice said, fading, family reasons for family reasons. About three weeks later, our first son was born. These experiences all occurred before birth, but there are reports of ongoing phenomena after birth occurs. 
For example, a woman named Louise Richardson describes how her daughter was mistreated by the nurses when she was born and the effects that she thought this had on her daughter. She was very jittery for the first six months. She didn't sleep through the night. She would jump at even the faintest of sounds. She would cry inconsolably when I laid her down or put her in a baby lounge or her swing, even in full view of me. She always cried when anyone else held her. She always cried in her car seat the whole length of a trip. I had the suspicion that this was because of the brutality when she was born. After about six months of this behavior, it became almost unbearable for both my daughter and myself. One night in the rocking chair, I had a mental conversation with her. I reassured her that I would always be with her. I'll never let anyone else do anything hurtful to her. And what happened in the hospital will never happen to her again. So how about if we call a truce? Do you know what happened? The next night she started sleeping through the night. And she was generally a lot more calm and content with life. At first I thought it was my imagination. But my husband, the neighbors, and my parents all commented on her change in behavior. My daughter is now eight months old and doing very well. Other parents have similar post-birth experiences. Elizabeth Hallett writes, Many parents describe a telepathic connection that allows them, sometimes, to sense their child's situation while they're apart. In fact, one mother points out that we may need to voluntarily loosen this psychic tie as our children grow. Fran's daughter is 10 years old. Since her birth, says Fran, I've always felt a sort of sixth sense about her, where she is or how she is doing. This is less in the last two or three years, mainly because I feel she needs to become her own self and that such a tie can become unhealthy without meaning to. I still have a strong hunch when she is sick or in trouble, and I hope that will continue, since it is so useful. Of course, a reality of life is that some children die before birth or shortly afterwards. We're fortunate that we live in an age and in parts of the world where medical techniques have greatly reduced infant mortality, and they should reduce them even further in the future. But it does happen, including in some of these cases. One unnamed woman told Hallett, Our first son was born and died long ago. Just days before his death at seven months, he appeared to me while I was holding him in my arms. The picture I saw of him was mature, with a man's beard growing on his cheeks and with the same blue eyes. It lasted long enough for me to comment to him at how handsome he was going to be as an adult. Since his death, I know that he often functions as a guardian for his brother. So this seemed to be a a post-birth contact that let the mother see what her son would look like as a man. Only since he died shortly thereafter, in hindsight, it seems to be an assurance that death would not be the end of his existence and that he would not always be stuck in the form of a baby. She believes that now he functions as a guardian for his new brother, perhaps as a saint praying for him in heaven, which would be exactly the sort of thing that a family member who has gone to heaven would pray for, the safety of their fellow family members who are still on earth, which makes a good transition to the faith and reason perspectives. So uh, before we get to those, we'd like to take a moment to thank our patrons who make this show possible, including Charles K, Dr. P, Craig H, John Z, and Jeff F. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give Make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. And you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part by The Grady Group, a Catholic company bringing financial clarity to their clients across the United States, using safe money options to produce reasonable rates of return for their clients. Learn more at gradygroupinc.com. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you by Great Lakes Customs Law, helping importers and individuals with seizures, penalties, and compliance with U.S. Customs Matters throughout the United States. Visit GreatLakesCustomsLaw.com. So, Jimmy, what theories are there about announcing dreams and the related phenomena? There are two basic kinds of explanations that we need to consider, normal explanations and paranormal ones. As with any paranormal investigation, we need to consider normal explanations first, since they're statistically the most common if you don't have additional evidence, and then only resort to paranormal ones to the extent that normal explanations don't suffice. When it comes 
to normal, natural explanations, there are several that we need to consider. First, there's random chance. Second, we need to consider other things besides random chance that could produce these experiences, including hoaxes, psychosis, and misperception, which could have a number of causes. And then there are paranormal explanations, which include things like precognition, telepathy, and the agency of human or non-human spirits. What can we say about announcing dreams and related experiences from the reason perspective? Is there a potential danger if we just assume that these have a paranormal explanation when they actually have natural ones? Yes, there is. And this is one of the things I really appreciate about one of the chapters in Elizabeth Hallett's book, Soul Trek. Smack dab in the middle of the book, she has a whole chapter called Reservations, in which she cross-examines these experiences. And one of the things she does is give a warning about superstitiously treating them as if they're all automatically paranormal. To set up this warning, she considers the following case of an unnamed mother who wrote, I was four months pregnant, and in a dream, the spirit of the baby I was carrying came and said she was sorry, but she had made a mistake, and now wasn't the right time to come, so she was going to leave. It scared me so much I went and had an abortion because I didn't know if I could bear a miscarriage. I wanted that baby so bad. So the woman had a dream where the baby said or appeared to say that she was going to miscarry. And the woman was so afraid of having a miscarriage that despite how much she really wanted the baby, she didn't wait for the miscarriage to occur and she aborted the child. Yikes. All kinds of things happen in dreams that do not reflect reality and our own fears can play out in our dreams. So Maybe it was the mother's very desire for the baby that led her to be afraid of the baby miscarrying, and that led her to have a dream about the baby rejecting her and deciding to miscarry, and then her fear of losing the child ended up becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy on the basis of the dream. Hallett warns against taking these experiences as certain to be true and writes, In the case of the woman who dreamed that her child announced its imminent departure, she might have chosen to submit the dream message to the test of time. Would she really have miscarried? Maybe she wouldn't have. Maybe the dream was nothing more than a dream. It was just a nightmare, and she would have carried the child to term. So we really need to examine these experiences and not just take them as gospel. Hallett goes on to give other good warnings about acting on these experiences rashly. But here we will focus on the basic question of whether they are normal or paranormal in origin. Then what do you think of random chance as a normal explanation for these experiences? I think it's quite possible, and it may explain a significant number of these experiences. Whenever you have something powerful going on in your life, you're likely to dream about it. Earlier this year, I did a 3,000-mile road trip to my hometown in Arkansas, which I was considering moving back to. It required me to drive for several days, you know, there and back, while consciously focusing on the often mountainous twisting road in front of me. And after I got back home, I dreamed multiple times about having to drive on very steep streets and roads, because that was what had just been going on in my life. Well, if you're pregnant or thinking about becoming pregnant, then you're likely to dream about that. You may dream that you are having a boy child or a girl child, and 50% of the time you're going to be right by random chance alone. Based on your knowledge of your family and your spouse's family history, you may be able to subconsciously guess the child's hair color or eye colors or their facial features and a lot of the time you'd be right by random chance. In fact, mothers today have almost certainly seen pictures of themselves when they were children, and they're very likely to have seen pictures of their husbands or other members of the husband's family when they were children, even if they've consciously forgotten about it. So maybe they subconsciously perceive what the child is likely to look like on purely natural grounds, and this then works its way into an announcing dream. The same would be true 
of feelings or perceptions that come to you in a non-dream state. Those also could be correct due to random chance based on subconscious guesses. So random chance could account for a lot of the aspects of the reports. What about the cases where the child's name is announced before birth? That could be similarly explained. Uh, Whether you dream of the child announcing its name or whether you dream that an angel or some other being has announced its name and whether it happens in a dream state or otherwise, that's something that your subconscious could come up with. Uh, One of the first things we always want to know about a child is its name, and parents have a lot of names rumbling around in their subconscious. So maybe your subconscious identifies one and gives it to you in an announcing dream, and then when you name the child this, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy that doesn't require a paranormal explanation. What would be required to show that something more than random chance is involved? Statistical studies, and as far as I know, no such studies have been conducted, but that's the real test, at least when you're dealing with phenomena that aren't themselves way outside the realm of probability. You'd need to do a careful study of the probabilities in a large number of these cases, uh, statistically. Do the parents who report these experiences know the sex of the child with the probability that well exceeds random chance? Do they correctly predict an unexpected hair or eye coloring or other characteristics of the child in a way that exceeds random chance? However, such studies don't seem to have been done at this point, which suggests future lines of parapsychological research for anyone who's interested. Then, setting aside random chance, let's consider other explanations for these experiences. Could some of them be hoaxes? Absolutely. Uh, People do hoax things, and it's very possible that some of these cases are hoaxes. However, not that many people commit hoaxes, and these experiences are quite commonly reported. Elizabeth Hallett, for example, has personally gathered hundreds of them, and I find it very unlikely that all of those people were hoaxing. Also, when people commit hoaxes, they often make them sound really amazing. So, While some of these accounts may be hoaxes, I don't think hoaxing is a good general explanation for them. What about mental illness? Could that be a good general explanation? I don't think so. Uh, Again, people do experience mental illness, and things like hearing voices can be a symptom of mental illness. Uh, Specifically, it can be a symptom of schizophrenia, as we discussed in episode 262 on the Rosenhan experiment. But in reading the accounts collected by Louisa Ryan and Elizabeth Hallett, the people don't who the people don't display or don't seem to display signs of mental illness. So while some of these accounts could be due to mental illness, I don't think it's a good general explanation of them. Then that would leave us with misperception as a final natural cause. What could cause misperception and how might it explain these experiences? There are a number of possible sources that could potentially factor into these experiences and cause them to be misperceived as paranormal messages. Uh, one of them is the simply the desire to reproduce. Uh, this is something that's built into all of us on a subconscious level, and it's often present in our conscious minds at different stages in life. So perhaps a prospective parent is consciously thinking about future children and that results in them having what appears to be an announcing dream. Or perhaps the person isn't consciously thinking about future children, and their subconscious programming to reproduce generates an announcing dream as a nudge to get them to reproduce. As a point of evidence, I'd note that there have been studies that suggest that women are have more of a desire to make love during the part of their cycle where they're fertile. Uh, We'll have links to information about that. It's connected to the release of luteinizing hormone, which in women causes the release of ova. And men also may have the ability to subconsciously detect when their partner is fertile and respond with an increased desire to make love. So our bodies are already increasing our desire to engage in reproductive behavior when we're fertile. And maybe announcing dreams sometimes get generated as part of that process to give us an extra nudge to reproduce. That's why we would need statistical studies conducted to establish that something beyond random chance is involved based on our native biology and psychology. 
Could another source of misperception be a subconscious perception, perhaps on the part of the mother? Yes, though it need not be just on the mother's part. A man might subconsciously perceive that his wife is pregnant and have an announcing dream to get him ready to be a father. Uh, And a woman certainly might subconsciously sense that she's pregnant and have an announcing dream or other experience to alert her to that fact. Subconscious perception also potentially could explain other aspects of the experiences. For example, there's an open question in science about whether a woman can sense the sex of her unborn child. We'll have a link to a 2017 scientific paper titled Maternal Intuition of Fetal Gender. The researchers surveyed a group of mothers in their second trimester. 40% of the mothers who had not yet had a sonogram reported having an intuition of their child's gender, but these intuitions were only 51% accurate, so that's just random chance. However, of those woman, women who reported having a strong intuition of the child's gender, 62% of the time the strong intuition was correct. So it's an open question whether some women do sense the sex of their unborn child. It's also an open question whether these women would be sensing it through normal or paranormal means. But because normal sensing is a possibility, it's possible that a woman might naturally sense the sex of her child, and then this could filter up into an announcing dream or related experience, which would make it even harder to sort out the matter statistically. And hypothetically, a mother might, naturally but subconsciously, since other things about her unborn child that might influence an announcing dream or related experience. Another possible source of misperception would be flawed memory. That is, people might misremember their announcing related experiences, and then after birth, they unintentionally adjust the memories of the experiences as fitting the child more closely than they did. They would thus misperceive the experience as being more accurate than it was. What do you make of this as an explanation? This is a real danger, and it crops up in other areas of parapsychology. For example, we talked about it in the recent episodes on modern reincarnation research. One of the things reincarnation researchers try to do is find cases where a child is reporting what seem to be past life memories, but where no previous person has yet been identified based on those memories. That way, the people involved in the case can't accidentally adjust their memories to fit the previous person. They can't unintentionally exaggerate similarities or unintentionally forget things that don't match the prior person. In the same way, parents might exaggerate similarities or diminish differences from their announcing related experiences. They might say, this baby looks just like the one I saw in my dream or vision when Really, it's not that similar. Flawed memories, hindsight, and confirmation bias are real possibilities in many of these cases, but I don't think that they're likely to be sufficient explanations for all of them. I don't think it's likely that you can explain them all due to faulty memories. What I would be interested in finding out is whether we have a major data reporting error here. You'll notice that all of the experiences we've heard about and that Ryan and Hallett reported are ones where the announcing experience was veridical, where the information turned out to be true once the child was born. But what about non-veridical ones? What about all the cases where someone has an announcing dream and then when the child is born, it was nothing like what the dream said? Well, such cases would likely simply go unreported. In scientific circles, that's what's known as the file drawer effect, or as publication bias. If you do an experiment and it confirms your hypothesis, you publish it. But if your experiment fails to confirm your hypothesis, you may stick it in a file drawer and not publish it, so nobody ends up hearing about it. The file drawer effect is a real problem, and parapsychologists have been at the forefront of combating it such as by pre-registering their studies and publishing them regardless of the results they obtain. So you need to do the same kind of thing in research on this topic. For example, you might get a large population of prospective parents, say thousands or tens of thousands of them, ask them before birth if they've had any announcing phenomena, 
and then check back after birth to see whether the announcing phenomena were accurate and whether they were accurate in a way that would exceed random chance. But I'm not aware of anything like that having been done, so it's another promising line of future parapsychological research. If that's what we need to say about the normal explanations for announcing dreams and related phenomena, what can we say about the paranormal ones? What could be involved here? There are three things that could be involved, uh, precognition, telepathy, and the involvement of spirits. Many of the announcing experiences would seem to be simple precognition, or at least could seem to be that. Uh, people may have a precognitive experience of what their future child will be like, and if it's genuinely a paranormal case of precognition, it would be accurate or should be accurate beyond random chance. Some of the experiences seem to involve things that nobody knew at the time, including the unborn child, and so the most natural explanation for them would appear to be precognition. For example, we heard about Roxy's experience seeing her daughter as an eight-month-old experiencing a rash from the formula she had to drink at, at the time. Since Roxy had to go on a medical treatment after her daughter was born that prevented her from nursing, Roxy didn't know that she would have to go on this medical treatment in the future, and she had no way of knowing that it would cause her daughter to develop a rash. So this looks like a straightforward case of precognition. Other experiences seem to involve telepathy, like communications between a mother and her unborn child, and the similar experiences of a mother communicating with her child telepathically after birth, though those aren't announcing experiences properly so called. That's just straightforward telepathy if it happens. However, some pre-birth experiences may also be explained by telepathy with the unborn child, who might reveal things to its mother like what sex it is. Though, of course, that would involve what level of consciousness and knowledge an unborn child has, which might be more than we realize if consciousness isn't fully dependent on having a fully developed and functioning brain as seems to be suggested by near-death experiences, like the ones we discussed in episode 27, where people don't have functioning normal brains, and yet they have experiences in which they learn and come to know things that they're not apparently coming to know through normal means. You also mentioned spirit involvement. What were you thinking about here? Well, in the case of some announcing experiences, a person seems to encounter an intermediary that is not simply the soul of the child. For example, uh, Diana Lorenz reported that her father was sitting in church when an angel came to him and told him that they would have a new daughter who they would later name Angela, presumably after the angel who announced the daughter. Or Anne Balfrey, who reported that a luminous being, presumably an angel, told her that she was so stubborn that it was as if she'd argue with God himself. Sometimes people also report seeing Jesus in these experiences, and all of these are cases where a spirit other than that of the unborn child is involved. Then there are cases where the spirit of the child apparently manifests prior to conception, so this is at least apparently a human spirit, but it isn't an incarnate human spirit yet like the one that Jill and Rob sensed they would become parents to if they made love that night, and that they believed they did later become the parents to. Or, in the case of Celestia Jasper, she believed that the spirit of her future son psychokinetically yanked her out of a river three months before he, uh, three years before he was born. What does parapsychology have to say about experiences like this? As a scientific discipline proceeding from the reason perspective rather than the faith perspective, parapsychology doesn't have a position on the existence of angels or the role of Jesus of Nazareth. However, it doesn't have a problem in principle with the idea that non-human spirits like angels exist, or that they, or that they may, or religious figures like Jesus or Buddha or whoever, may be involved in human affairs. It's uh, that's a matter of faith, not of science. It certainly doesn't have a problem with the idea that human spirits exist. Uh, many parapsychologists study evidence concerning the existence of human spirits, and from, a, from the scientific perspective, the discipline of parapsychology 
doesn't have a problem with the idea that human personalities or human spirits may exist before conception. Now, some parapsychologists may not believe in human spirits or non-human spirits or religious figures. Some don't. Some are purely materialists. In fact, one of the classic problems in parapsychology is figuring out how to show that a spirit of any kind is involved or whether you're just watching a demonstration of psychic abilities by the living. But from an overall perspective, the field of parapsychology doesn't reject any of these possibilities. At this point, we're transitioning into the faith perspective. So what can we say about announcing dreams and related experiences from the faith perspective? Are they possible? Well, they're definitely possible from the faith perspective. We started off with Joseph's announcing dream of Jesus, which is perhaps the most famous announcing dream of all time. So they can definitely happen. And Joseph's experience is far from the only one in Scripture. In fact, they're more common in Scripture than you might realize. To name examples off the top of my head without doing a lot of research to see if there are others, well... The patriarch Abraham and his wife Sarah had an announcing experience where God and two angels showed up, and God said that Abraham and Sarah would have their son Isaac. Uh, The prophet Isaiah told King Ahaz about the birth of a child who would be assigned to him that he would not be defeated by his enemies, and that child was possibly his own son, the future King Hezekiah. In the New Testament era, the priest Zechariah had an announcing experience where the angel Gabriel foretold the birth of his son, John the Baptist, and then the angel Gabriel gave an announcing experience to the Virgin Mary and told her that she would give birth to Jesus. In Scripture, we also have an announcing experience that occurs after conception. In Genesis 25, we read, Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his prayer, and Rebekah his wife conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is thus, why do I live? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples born of you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other, the elder shall serve the younger. So announcing dreams and other announcing experiences are very possible from the faith perspective. The announcing experiences you've just listed all involve God or angels serving as mediators in the experiences. It's God or an angel that makes the announcement. What would the faith perspective say about announcing experiences that seem to be psychic in nature? Well, it could be that God or angels or saints are also causing these experiences, but in a hidden way so that the parents don't realize it. However, as we've discussed in previous episodes, the Catholic faith doesn't have a problem in principle with the existence of psychic abilities. Uh, We discussed aspects of that in episode 79 on religion, magic, psychic phenomena, and science. We also discussed it in episodes 105 and 106 on St. Thomas Aquinas and the Occult. And we discussed it in episode 246 and especially in episode 247 on dowsing. As I've often mentioned, doctors of the church like St. Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas believed in what we would call precognition, which St. Thomas called natural prophecy to distinguish it from the supernatural prophecy that comes from God. St. Thomas also believed in the psychic ability we would call psychokinesis, and specifically in the form of psychokinesis called distant mental influence on living systems, which was his explanation for how the evil eye works. So the faith doesn't have a problem in principle with the idea that psychic powers may exist. That's a question to be settled by science from the reason perspective. And if God has built psychic abilities into human nature, then there's no reason why abilities like precognition and telepathy couldn't be responsible for the announcing-related experiences that we're discussing today. If psychic functioning is real, would that mean that people who don't have faith could also have announcing experiences? It certainly could. And even if you concluded that psychic functioning isn't real, people of any faith or no faith might have such experiences. They might have them for purely natural reasons, or they might have them because God loves everyone. We're all his children, and he or one of his angels might cause any set of prospective parents to have such an experience. And if psychic functioning is real, the parents' own psychic abilities might produce them. Certainly, there doesn't appear to be a religious bias in the current literature. 
The most extensive work on the subject seems to have been done by Elizabeth Hallett, and she surveys accounts from people from a wide variety of faith backgrounds. Uh, Some are Christian and some aren't. Some are religious in another faith tradition and some aren't. She's a registered nurse, and she seems to have lots of connections with the natural birth and midwife communities. And a lot of the accounts she reports are from people with a New Age or Native American religious perspective or a mix of perspectives. Each person puts an interpretation on the experiences based on their religious background, but they don't seem to be associated with any one religious background. Now, let's talk about the cases where spirits seem to be involved. Obviously, from the faith perspective, there's no problem if God or angels are involved. We've seen examples of that in Scripture. And there's no problem after conception when the spirit of the child definitely exists and might communicate with its parents. But what about the experiences we've heard about that were before conception and the child's spirit at least seemed to be to the parents to be involved? What would the faith have to say about those? Well, of course, it could just be precognition or a vision of the, you know, related to the future that the parents are happening and they're misinterpreting it as this is the spirit of my future child when really it's a vision. But here we go. The idea that spirits exist before conception is known as the pre existence of souls. It's also sometimes called pre existentialism. It was an idea that was held by at least some pre-Christian Jews, such as the Jewish philosopher Philo of Alexandria. A version of it also appears to have been accepted by the Jewish sect known as the Essenes, who were commonly regarded as the authors of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And it was also held by some early Christian thinkers, such as the early Christian writer Origen, who lived in the late 100s and early 200s, and by various others. This view also was rejected by many in the church. However, I've done a careful study of the subject, and much to my surprise, it doesn't appear that the view itself has been condemned by the church's magisterium. You can find a couple of local councils, not ecumenical councils, that rejected one version of pre-existentialism. One of the councils was a local council held in Constantinople in AD 543, and the other was a local council held in Braga, Portugal in AD 561. Because both of these were local councils, they don't automatically have authority for the whole church, and the teaching hasn't been repeated in centuries, so it may have fallen into desuetude. But even if you assume that the teachings of these councils is still authoritative and should apply to the whole church, they just aren't condemning pre-existence itself. Instead, they're condemning a version of pre-existence that holds human souls sinned before birth and were sent to be born as a punishment for that sin. The Synod at Constantinople stated, If anyone says or holds that human souls had a previous existence, such that first they were spirits or blessed powers, that, having become tired of the contemplation of God and turned to evil, grew cold in the love of God, and for this reason came to be called souls, and so were in punishment sent down into bodies, let him be anathema. And the council at Braga stated, If anyone says that the human souls first committed sin in the heavenly abode, and for this reason were thrown down on earth into human bodies, as Priscillian has said, let him be anathema. So neither of these local councils was condemning the idea of preexistence itself. They were condemning the idea that souls were exiled to bodies because of sin they committed in the heavenly realm. And this isn't what's being claimed for encounters with the spirits of children before conception. So Rather surprisingly, given what many people have heard, including me, these experiences don't actually seem to fall afoul of church teaching. What's more, and also rather surprisingly, there's even a passage in the Book of Wisdom that at least sounds like it envisions the pre-existence of the human soul. The passage is Wisdom 8, verses 19 and 20, which read... As a child, I was by nature well endowed, and a good soul fell to my lot. 
or rather being good, I entered an undefiled body. So the author says that being good, he entered an undefiled body. That certainly does not support the idea that we were sent into bodies because of sins in the preexistence. On this passage, the Anchor Bible Commentary states, This verse is as clear a statement of the concept of pre-existent souls as one could wish, and there is no need to explain it away as many commentators have done. Now, I want to make it clear that other commentators have disagreed and have interpreted this passage in other ways, but at least on its face, it can sound like it's teaching the pre-existence of souls. What does the Catholic faith teach about the origin of souls? According to the Catechism of the Catholic Church, The Church teaches that every spiritual soul is created immediately by God. It is not produced by the parents, and also that it is immortal. It does not perish when it separates from the body at death, and it will be reunited with the body at the final resurrection. This passage in the Catechism also refers in a footnote to Pius XII's 1950 encyclical Humanae Generis, where Pius XII also teaches that the soul is created immediately or directly by God. But neither the Catechism nor Humanae Generis say when God did this. My own view has always been that it happens at the moment of conception. The rational soul is the form of the body that keeps it alive, and we have living bodies from the moment of conception, so we must have rational souls from that point forward. However, despite the fact that my view has long been that God creates our soul at the moment of conception, church teaching, to my surprise, doesn't seem to eliminate the possibility that God created our souls at an earlier point, and so it doesn't seem to rule out the possibility that parents may be having encounters with the soul of their future child who has not yet been conceived. Suppose that your long-held view is correct, that souls are created at the moment of conception. What would that mean for these experiences? Well, it would mean that they have been misinterpreted in some way. Uh, perhaps they happen to be ones that have normal causes and nothing paranormal is actually going on in these experiences. Or perhaps something paranormal is going on and the parents are just mistakenly interpreting it as an encounter with the soul of their future child when really it's something else. For example, perhaps they're experiencing precognition of, whether, of what their future child will be like and they're mistakenly interpreting it as the presence of their child's spirit. Or perhaps they're being given a supernatural vision of their child and interpreting it not as a vision of the future, but as the current present presence of that child. What about Celestia Jasper's experience? If she was psychokinetically yanked out of a river, that would be more than precognition. Yes, but if she was psychokinetic, psychokinetically yanked out of a river, that doesn't mean it was her future child doing it. Perhaps her guardian angel did it and communicated to her that she still had work to do in life, like having a future child, and then she misinterpreted this as a message from her future child. Or perhaps her own psychokinesis kicked in and did it. Uh, perhaps she precognitively sensed her future child and then saved herself so that she could have him. Or perhaps she just wanted to have a child before dying and did it herself. And then she interpreted this as having been done by the child. Or perhaps it was her husband's psychokinesis that did it for parallel reasons, because he was right there on the shore and had been trying to save her. And this is a constant problem in parapsychology. Even if something seems to be done by a spirit, like that of your future child, how do you know it isn't actually being done by a different spirit, like a guardian angel or by the psychic abilities of a living human? So I do think that there are explanations for these experiences if my traditional view is correct and souls are created at the moment of conception and not before. Anything else we should say before we go? Writing this episode was a lot tougher than I thought it would be. I love kids, I love babies, and I thought it would just be a nice happy story for this episode where I get to write about mysteries connected with babies. So I started reading Elizabeth Hallett's books, and there was just story after story about fathers and mothers having babies. You know, story after story. 
one happy couple after another, experiencing the love and joy of having children. And the effect was it forced me to think a lot more about what I don't have. Uh, As a young man, I wanted to get married and have a lot of kids. I know I was a really good husband before I was widowed, and I think I would have been a great father too. Well, I got married, but then I was widowed, and that was the first of a series of blows that hit me in young adulthood, and it took a long time to heal, and by the time I healed and was stronger again, it looked like I'd missed my chance. I don't dwell on this, you know, I'm a happy person, but there are occasions it can be a little tough. The worst is Father's Day. People at church, like the ushers, assume that I'm a father and wish me happy Father's Day, and I just smile and say thank you, but when that happens, it always just really gets me. One of the things that struck me in some of the stories, uh, that some of the parents were initially very hesitant to have a child in the, in the books that I was reading for this episode. Some of the parents were even opposed to having kids. Personally, I'd love to be able to get married again and even have children if that were possible, but I don't know that I'll be able to. So I wanted to close this episode by saying, if you're having doubts about having children, don't. Don't have doubts. Babies are awesome. So don't miss the chance to have them. If the question is whether to have children or whether to have another child, go ahead. Don't worry about whether the time is perfect. Times are almost never perfect. And don't let the perfect become the enemy of the good. Babies, new human beings, are great goods. So welcome them and have them. Excellent. I totally agree. So, Jimmy, what's your bottom line on announcing dreams? Announcing dreams and related phenomena are absolutely fascinating. Many of them may have purely natural causes. Many may be explained by random chance. Some may be explained by hoaxes, mental illness, or misperception. But at least some of them have paranormal or supernatural causes. Paranormal causes may involve precognition and telepathy and some cases involve direct supernatural intervention, like the angel who announced the birth of Jesus to St. Joseph in the most famous announcing dream of them all. And what further resources can we offer to the listeners and viewers? We'll have links to Elizabeth Hallett's book, Soul Trek, Meeting Our Children on the Way to Birth, and her book, Stories of the Unborn Soul, The Mystery and Delight of Pre-Birth Communication, as well as a link to Louisa Ryan's book, Hidden Channels of the Mind. We'll also have a link to Jim Matlock's article, Announcing Dreams, in the Science Encyclopedia, as well as a link to that scientific uh, study or an article about the study I mentioned, Does Ovulation Change Women's Desire After All? An article on increased drive during ovulation, information on luteinizing hormone, and that paper I mentioned on maternal intuition of fetal gender. All right. So that's it from us this time. What are your theories about announcing dreams and related phenomena? Let us know by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Yakin's Mysterious World Facebook page, sending us an email to feedback at mysterious.fm, sending a tweet to at mys underscore world, visiting the StarQuest Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord, or calling our mysterious feedback line at 619 619- 738-4515. That's 619-738-4515. And I want to say a special word of thanks to Oasis Studio 7 for the video and animation work they did on this episode. They are available for hire for your own video and animation work. You can check out what they do or just check out the video version of the podcast for its own sake at my YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash Jimmy Aiken. And while you're there, I am trying to grow my channel, so I'd really appreciate it if you subscribe and hit the bell notification so that you always get notified whenever I have a video, whether it's Mysterious World or something else. Also, be sure to like and comment on the videos because that tells the YouTube algorithm that you found them engaging, and so the algorithm will share the videos with more people. So you can promote the show by liking, commenting, and especially subscribing. Also want to say a special thanks to Melanie Bettinelli for helping with the female voice work in this episode. 
So, Jimmy, what's our next episode going to be about? Next week, we're going to be looking at an outright religious mystery. Specifically, we're going to be talking about the reported apparitions of Our Lady of Zaytun in 1968 in a sur- suburb of Cairo, Egypt. Folks, be sure to follow Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, TuneIn, your favorite podcast app, or at Jimmy's YouTube channel, where you should, as he said, hit the bell to get notifications. You can find links to Jimmy's resources from our discussion on our show notes at mysterious.fm slash 282. And remember, to help us continue to produce the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Yakin's Mysterious World is also brought to you by DeliverContacts.com, offering contact lenses at low prices with free delivery. Visit DeliverContacts.com. And by Rosary Army, featuring award-winning Catholic podcasts, rosary resources, videos, and the School of Mary online community, prayer, and learning platform. Learn how to make them, pray them, and give them away while growing in your faith at rosaryarmy.com and schoolofmary.com. And by Tim Shevlin's personal fitness training for Catholics, providing spiritual and physical wellness programs and daily accountability check-ins. Strengthen yourself to help further God's kingdom. Work out for the right reason with the right mindset. Learn more by visiting fitcatholics.com. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on StarQuest.